Hi, everyone. Good morning. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today for our first ever Meet the Woman Innovator webinar. I am Veronica, Diversity and Inclusion Partner at Innovate UK KTN and Program Lead for the Women in Innovation Award. I'm sure you will all agree with me that there is great power in innovation and that there is even greater power in the innovation led by diverse game changers who serve the needs of diverse communities through their businesses. We believe in the remarkable power and in our role to spotlight, empower them and challenge existing assumptions, which is what we are going to do through this new series. Our speakers today are all inspiring game changers in their beautiful ways. They are women innovators who have the courage to choose and continue their entrepreneurial journey in innovation. Before I quickly introduce them, I would like to mention that the feel of the discussion today is aimed to be conversational, warm, friendly, and open. We encourage you to be part of the discussion. Uh, therefore, we will have the Q&A and the chat functions available for any comments, impressions, or questions you might want to share. Please use the Q&A for your questions only though. Also, if necessary, you can enable live subtitles using the closed captioning function available. It is now my pleasure to mention our wonderful speakers. We have here today Sam Jackman, co-founder and director at Boost Innovations, who will be moderating the discussion. Penny Morton, founder DYI Women and Young Innovator Award holder. And Leslie Gaston Bird, founder Mix Messiah Productions and Women Innovation Award. Sam, over to you now to start the conversation. Uh, thank you all and enjoy it fully. Thanks, Veronica. So I'm going to start um, just a little bit with an introduction to, uh, to who I am, and then I'm going to pass on to my fellow panelists to tell you all a little bit more about what we do in our own words, and hopefully that will start getting the conversation going. So my name's Sam, I am the co-founder of Boost Innovations and we work mostly with women who've had breast cancer to innovate around the products and services that would suit them better. We are dedicated to human-centered design, we listen to what women are telling us and we are creating new and different products and services in that space based on the feedback that women are telling us. And that, that kind of makes us quite different and it makes us quite um, difficult for some of the established routes um, and the established products that are already available um, for different things. Um, Boost has been funded by Innovate UK in different ways um, through different competitions. For, well, since I think 2019 was when we first had a small grant award. Um, and we're just really super proud to be doing what we're doing. The feedback from our customers is always wonderful. And we are just um, delighted to, to be part of this kind of women in innovation um, conversation, really. We just think it's really important that there's more women who are innovating in, in areas that affect other women because having our voices heard is really important. So that's that's me and that's why I'm here and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm gonna pass to Leslie now to introduce herself and to explain a little bit more about what she does and why she's on the panel today. Leslie. Hi, thanks very much for the warm welcome. And uh, it's a great honor to be here today. I'm excited to share my journey with you. And um, yeah, so uh, my name is Leslie Gaston Bird and I, as you might be able to tell, from the United States, where I taught at the University of Colorado, Denver, um, for 13 years. Then I moved to England in 2017, and that's when I decided to go into business for myself. So in addition to doing some teaching, I've been uh, running Mix Messiah Productions, which is a company that does post-production audio for film and television. Uh, but my idea to expand and uh, start doing workshops for uh, women in underrepresented groups and sound uh, began with the sort of emergence of immersive sound. So immersive sound is the big buzzword. You may have heard of spatial audio, immersive audio, 360 audio. And um, so what I would like to do is um, facilitate the... Um, you know, growth in numbers that needs to happen with women in underrepresented groups in this space, space, since, you know, when I go to trade shows, when I go to academic conferences, 
very often what I see are um, white male dominated spaces. And so um, especially since this technology is burgeoning and it's economically viable and strong, we want to make sure that our voices are represented as creators, as engineers um, of this technology. So Immersive and Inclusive is the name of the workshops that I'm starting to offer. And um, we have support from AVID, makers of Pro Tools, uh, through their AVID Learning Collective. We have a diversity and an inclusive uh, sponsorship to help with textbooks and certification on Pro Tools. Of course, we have support from Innovate UK and the Women in Innovation Program, which is tremendously helpful in helping with equipment and helping with scholarships. And um, we also have a couple manufacturers who have provided equipment and resources for us. So uh, we're very excited about this new chapter. Oh, Sam, you're uh, muted. Yeah. I have to stop doing that. Um, thanks, Leslie. That's a really great introduction. Penny, um, can you tell us a bit about, about yourself and what you're up to? Hello, um, so I'm Penny Morton and uh, I'm the founder of CLI Women <laughs> and I'm just going to be totally honest, right now my flight got changed so I'm actually in the airport right now so I just really apologise uh, if there's any, if I've got to my camera off for myself, <laughs> I'm just going to be straight up on it. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm here for you. Anyway, um, so I'm a young innovator and um, so through this programme i am been developing DIY Women, which is workshops to equip and empower other women to get building, get making, but also really kind of diversify the engineering construction and trade workforce on the other side. Um, it's like only 4% um, of the UK uh, trade workforce are female, which is just way too small. And um, so as an engineer myself, and I've got experience being one of the first female uh, laborers at a company, I really understand the kind of maybe the, the barriers and I think DRI Women is really trying to kind of break down that. But mm -hmm. as well on the flip side, um, I, I'm an engineer and I work at a company for three days a week. And then I'm able to work the other two days um, on DRI Women through the Young Innovators Award, which I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you a bit more about it later on. But <laughs> apologies again. <laughs> Thanks, Penny. And we do really appreciate the efforts that you've gone to to join us. It sounds like you had a bit of a nightmare. So absolutely fine. If you need to, to switch off for a few minutes, then that's OK in between. And if I shout to you and you're not there, we obviously know what's going on. Um, so we're going to start with a few questions just to get the conversation going. But please, as Veronica said at the beginning, please do um, submit some questions into the Q&A or talk to us in the chat. It's absolutely um, brilliant to have everybody listening. If you think of something you want to ask us, then get involved because that's what we want to hear. But firstly, we're going to start with like the inspiration behind our businesses and what actually was behind us moving into becoming innovators in our spaces so um i would love to to hand that over to to leslie to start with and just to ask her what what was the inspiration behind your business and and were you always planning to be an innovator or is this something you've just sort of come into um that's a great question thank you for asking it yes i um as an educator i think I saw my path, uh, you know, I was a tenured associate professor. I thought, oh, I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life. But, you know, life often has different plans for us. So we ended up moving. But actually, um, the inspiration for this started during my time as a professor in Colorado. And uh, I had a great mentor who happened to meet a man. His name was Rich Sanders, the late, great Rich Sanders, who passed away um, in 2009. But uh, he... Um, around 2005 asked me to teach a class in surround sound for him and it was the first time maybe the second time that I really got to dive in I knew what surround sound was as an audio engineer I've gone to movies and I like hearing sound all around and but now I'm teaching the technology and I'm teaching um, the psychoacoustics so why does sound coming from behind us sound different than sound coming from a, in front of us and why do we need a speaker in the center a center speaker, what, you know, why do we need that? Um, and, and hearing what it sounds like, you know, at having access to a laboratory. And that access word 
uh, will come up again. Um, so when I moved to England, it was a kind of a different ball game. I'm actually a PhD candidate at the University of Surrey because in terms of rank, an associate professor in America is kind of the rank of senior lecturer here. So I needed to skill up, as I think a lot of women are always finding themselves having to skill up or degree up to stay uh, viable in terms of job opportunities. So um, I was sort of combining all of these interests to say, okay, I'm an educator, I love immersive sound, I've done lots of research in immersive sound, and so how can, you know, what can I do here? Um, I also wrote a book called Women in Audio, so I'm author of a book um, published by Focal Press Routledge, and in writing that book, I became inspired. I mean, there's so many inspirational women in audio uh, from whom I can draw inspiration. Terry Winston of the Women's Audio Mission in San Francisco, Carrie Kyes from Sound Girls. She's a, a monitor engineer for Pearl Jam. She's on tour right now, I think. Um, uh, women here in the UK, such as Eddie Dobson at University of Huddersfield, who did Yorkshire, Yorkshire Sound Women's Network, 2% Rising. I mean, there are so many organizations working with women. So, you know, I'm sort of making my icky guy diagram, you know, the, um, the ways, you know, what's your purpose, what's your passion, how can you help others, you know, so I was combining those. And so uh, I wanted to start this initiative, Immersive and Inclusive. Um, so the need is, you know, like I said earlier, going to academic and trade conferences, male dominated to a greater degree than the audio industry at large, according to studies by Kat Young, um, who I believe is at, oh, I'm sorry, I can't think of her affiliation right now, maybe York, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, there's, there are women who have been studying microaggressions in recording studios, you know, the, the number of women who are in audio and in what spaces and doing what roles. So all of this research, you know, led me to say, okay, here's where the need is, getting women in underrepresented groups in immersive sound specifically. So that's what I hope to bring is access, access to the tools, to the equipment, to the certification, all of these things that we need to participate in the immersive audio space. That's wonderful. So from an education background, from a from an academic background into the world of innovation, just because you saw an opportunity that it saw a, a gap, really, a, a space that needed to be filled, which is, is just fabulous. And um, Penny, how, how did you how did you start um, on your journey? And uh, were you always planning to be an innovator yourself? Or do you think you you've also just kind of taken that pathway? Um, so at university, I studied product design engineering. So that was kind of combined with mechanical engineering, a little bit electrical. And then at the art school, we did um, like, here's a problem, come up with a solution. So for example, how can we help elderly people be more independent in the home for long term? Um, so I think like during my university kind of degree, um, I was always really thinking about innovation. Like I would walk to school, you know, I would walk around and think, could this be better? Like I feel like I've got that innovation mind. But I think something which I've always lacked and just at university, you take something to three quarters, like you you design it, you prototype, it, you come up with a solution. You never think about the business aspects of it. And that's mm. for me, it's like when it's an actual success. Like you can come up with all these amazing designs, but at the end of the day, like if, if you can't come up with a good business behind it, it's not going to be sustainable. So I think mm. that was something like after leaving uni, COVID happened. I was I kind of entered a few design almost competitions. I did win a few of them as well in terms of like helping other people. But I it wasn't like it didn't I don't know, it didn't get me out of bed in the morning. And through university, um, I was the president of FEMED, so the Female Engineering Society, and I was always so passionate about how can we get more females into engineering? <laughs> uh, it was called FEMED, and my dad was like, what about men in? I was like, uh, have, you seen the, have you seen the whole engineering cohort? That's what men in is. <laughs> so I think that was um, just a really pa big passion of mine. And then after my personal experience of being an only female in a, a male only workshop, and then being that first female labor at that company, I think it was just kind of a, a culmination of all those things that made me think, actually, instead of designing like a product that's innovative, why not a service, which is DIY women and having workshops. But um, and kind of through the, the last year with the Young Innovators Programme, I've really been upscaling myself as 
kind of the business side and um, so that's something which has been amazing but yeah I think my motivation has kind of been a, a culmination maybe of a, a, like three or four different experiences and just my general passion for equality and inclusion thank you thank you penny and um in one of the comments jen has just said that she just totally agrees with what you've been saying about connecting design with business planning and i think that that is something that um we will possibly talk about a bit further on when we talk about our challenges and how we've overcome them and the support we've had but it is it is interesting that you can have really wonderful ideas you can see a really good niche in the market but also you need to have um the either the support behind you or um the business brain that goes along with it to really seize that opportunity and it's quite interesting how and um, we've been balancing our journeys and our stories kind of linked together i will just um share a little bit about boost and where we came from if, if that's okay because boost is also um it's kind of an in-between one for both of your stories because Boost came about because my mum had had breast cancer and she couldn't find the products and services that really she really needed. Um, and it was over 17 years ago when we searched and searched and searched for all these things, particularly a new type of breast form, and there wasn't one available. So we decided in the end that if she was going to get the product she needed, that I might have to make it myself um and uh, and we decided to to sort of launch a company find out more about what was going on in that space and that's kind of how we um we got to where we are we just we, we just knew that there was this thing that was needed and that nobody else was doing it so it was all a, a little bit accidental for me but also really identifying that that gap and, and listening to the people who were also telling me that they also needed that thing which was quite interesting um okay so um so you know a little bit about us now um uh, which is really great um i'm gonna go back to penny again if that's okay penny what are your short-term goals and your longer-term goals what's actually what are you working on at the moment if that's all right <laughs> Yeah, so um, last week I did a workshop with kids actually, um, a, a very basic kind of Jesuit workshop, uh, back to back to the school kids, and it was really good because I thought if I can do this to children, I could do it to adults. <laughs> um, so I think, and then um, towards the end of the next month is my kind of first paying workshop, so my MVP, which I didn't even know what it meant when I first started this journey. Everyone's like, you need an MVP, and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> This is something that I've definitely been learning a lot. It's like it's like engineering. It's all this uh, technical language. All oh, the language. You've got to learn the language that goes alongside it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in terms of short term, um, my goals are to, you know, get paying customers to the workshop. I've kind of been finalising uh, the workshop, exactly what we're making. Um, and then the kind of longer term is to get people to run those workshops for me. So I've already had inquiries from, say, like a female plasterer who's contacted me. She's like, this is amazing. Like, I'd love to be able to do it, to do something with you. And my kind of vision long term is like, I'm not the jack of all trades. Like, I, I'm not a plaster. I've plastered my own ceiling, but like, I'm not a professional plaster. <laughs> so my really vision is to really get other female trade workers to, to come in and run these workshops but I'm the facilitator like I'm the person who gets the the people the customers there and you know makes it maybe a bit fun and like maybe something a bit different and also like as you said listening to what do people want because that's something that I find really interesting is when I speak to people like I spoke to a woman last week and she was like I upcycled this amazing shelf but I, I needed to wait for my husband to come home to put it on the shelf and she was so frustrated at herself so like it might be that like my workshops change direction in terms of okay maybe it's much more about putting things up on the wall or you know maybe more practical DIY than maybe a bit more creative side I don't know so for me that's definitely the short term is to really just do these workshops and listen to the feedback that I get um, and then yeah I guess that long term if I'm totally honest like I try not to think too far ahead <laughs> I get scared um, I think because I'm just at the start of my journey, like I'm really just taking it one one month at a time because I, I got given advice from someone. It's like, um, if you plan something, you should like double the time and double the cost and then you will actually have an accurate estimation. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think long term is, I'm also young girl, so I'm kind of juggling like my three day uh, job at Kumo, which I love and it allows me to travel. 
as well as working on DIY women on the side. And I think that's something I'm, I'm quite honest about, is especially when you're starting out on your journey. You have to, you know, think about what do you really want to do in, say, 10 years' time and, and think about that. So, yeah, <laughs> I think short term, just do the workshops and see how they go and really evaluate is there a business to be had? Like, can, how many workshops would I need to do to pay myself a wage? Because everyone always says that, like, can you, you're too tired to do charity, like, oh no, you get, and I'm like, I oh, don't know, but I want to try and make a business. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's really where I'm at right now. And I think by the end of this year, I'll have that decision, like, do I, you know, really go jump right in and do this? Or do I like have to take stock? So yeah, that's me. I think, I think that really resonates with me as well because we and probably and I'm assuming with Leslie, but I'll, I'll move on and um, to Leslie in a sec. But yeah, to have that where you're thinking, I know I'm doing good in the world, but I also know I will need to have wages and I'll probably have to have staff and I need to pay them. And balancing that, I think, is as a female entrepreneur in particular, I find that I have. So I find that quite difficult. And in my long-term goals, I think for Boost, we want to hire more staff, we want to grow, because at the heart of it, it, we know we'll help more women if we grow and we have a resilient business model. But at the same time, you also think, oh, I just really want to get these things to people. You know, I really want to get the service to people. I really want to get this thing out there. And, and it's that balance. And um, Leslie, if I could just come to you and ask you a similar question. Um, where, where are you going in the short term at the moment? What are you working on right now? And in the longer term, um, how is your business developing? I love um, sometimes when I read other people's posts on uh, social media, a lot of people say, it's just like riding a bike, except for the bicycle's on fire and the building's on fire <laughs> and everything's on fire. So it's just, it's exactly how it is. Like short term, um, you know, I'm still completing. So in order to deliver teaching and certification, I have to get cert- certified. So step one, get certified. Um, in order to have workshops, I need the equipment in place. I'm getting the equipment in place. So I'm really, it's sort of like um, chomping at the bit, trying to get, you know, it's like, all I want to do is, you know, share my knowledge, but so many things have to be in place. So that's where I am short term is just, you know, sort of preparing the house, preparing the space, um, you know, and making sure that um, I'm getting money in the meantime, you know, because you don't want to prepare forever. Um, just as a, a side story, I think this kind of illuminates um, the fear that I have. So I'm, you know, an older um <clears throat> I'm not old. I'm just older. Um, but anyway, um, my mother uh, was elderly um, in like 2007, seven, eight, and we were trying to get the house ready to sell because she was moving into um, a different house. Um, and I remember the real estate agent said, you know, well, let's, t- you know, get the kitchen redone, do the floors, you know, get the house ready for market. And I'm, a little of that is okay, but at some point, you got to sell the house, you know, so it's, it, I feel that sort of sense of urgency right now. It's like, um, how much preparation is too much preparation, you know? Um, I mean, we're doing things like logo, mar- you know, designing the logo and getting our, our marketing and brand, but it's, you know, I think this sort of, it's labor pains, I guess. Having ha- had two children, I can say, yeah, I can see a similarity between being pregnant and giving birth. It's like, giving birth is kind of a painful experience. And so <laughs> that's an understatement. And I don't think you can understate, you know, the amount of, um, you know, that tension between being ready and not being ready. It's definitely stressful. Um, but longer term, to answer your longer term questions, you know, what I envision is, you know, having a schedule of classes, being, to, being able to recruit um, students, being able to find opportunities for them after they get their training, tracking that making sure that we have a sense of how effective we are being so that is kind of the stage two is making sure we're also ready to you know not just have you know not be a a factory um but to actually actually make sure we're having the impact we want to have and you have to do that by um, talking to your students or your clients um and making sure the experience is what they expected um, that is delivering uh, what they need. And so that'll be kind of our phase two. 
That's really great. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I'm just uh, pulling stuff out of the chat here. I don't know um, if you've had a chance to look, but somebody said that just getting their stuff done is their daily goal in the short, short term. And I think we can all resonate with that. There's this balance and, and almost a pressure. As I was asking that question about long term planning, I think it's good to have a vision, but actually sometimes things just evolve in in the way that they evolve and we have and we have an overview plan but quite often we're all I can feel that that person who said that I can feel that that we're so busy in our daily lives just getting through your your daily to-do list getting the kids to school getting the washing done um, and all the other pressures that um that you can have just just in your daily life is is also quite um an interesting thing to have to balance alongside being an innovator having that responsibility and yeah. um and sorry oh no I was just agreeing I probably should have had my <laughs> mic muted but I yeah I agree. oh no 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 that's fine Leslie it's lovely it's lovely to hear um and there was uh, also a comment um for Penny really about um how perhaps established older women oh she's gone dark oh she's gone <laughs> It's okay. It's are you still good. there, Penny? Yeah, one second. Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ah, oh, there you are. Um, so um, there's a que there was a question for Penny, or just a comment about how perhaps involving established career or older women who were had had careers in engineering and had, had been through quite a lot of that journey already could also, or or women in trades could also help perhaps to encourage women who were emerging into that space and I guess that's the same for maybe for sound engineering or any any place where there's an underrepresentation. is there more does the panel think there's more we can do to encourage the few women who've kind of trailblazed to really support those others that are emerging in that space well I, I think they call that the minority tax it was it's a great <laughs> little it's a great little phrase that sort of reminds people that yeah, we're we're underrepresented, and we have been taught that. Okay, you made it. You're making money now. You know, maybe not millions, but um, you're successful. You need to give back. You know, and people sort of raise their brow at you, like, "So, what have you done lately to help those less fortunate?" And you're thinking, "I'm just trying to survive." Um, free but mentoring, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure to give free mentoring. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way, Leslie. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so so you do feel that that obligation, and yeah. I think it's something that you do with joy. You know, I think especially because you get rewarded as you're pulling people up. And, you know, a, a lot of time, you know, I don't mean to brag, but it is um, inspiring and, and uh, energizing to hear when people are getting help from you and they appreciate the things that they do for you. But we also have to sort of tap our, our allies on the shoulder and say, it's not just up to me. It's up to all of us. You know, we have to remember that we're as a community. So, um, you know, to answer your questions, you know, how do you get um, trailblaz trailblazing women on board? I, I think they are, you know, I don't think I have ever met a trailblazing woman or person of color who wasn't trying to give back, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's that they don't, you, you can't get them on board. I think it's like they're already on board with five things over there and you're trying yeah. to get them for thing number six. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, but, you know, um, even if you think of the extremely rich celebrities, mm -hmm. you know, each of them have demands on their time. So, yeah, I, th I don't think it's a question of if, but it's more of a question of how much. So um, I'm not sure about the Young Innovators Awards, I'm sure Penny will say, but I think the Women in Innovation Award holders, they are encouraged that part of the, the funding that enables you to give time to your innovation journey, as far as I understand it, includes being able to, to offer some support in, in spaces like this, maybe, um, and part of that almost being an ambassador, being out in the public as an Innovate UK awardee, um, to actually support your time to to do that kind of work, um, is that does that work? For, is, Penny, do you feel like as an as an awardee of the Young Innovators Program that that's part of what you 
you feel like you can you do or that you can offer yeah so part of the young innovation program uh, we all do like role modeling and um, yeah. so for instance i actually i mean i i feel like i was doing article smart then and so maybe each week or sometimes uh, sometimes twice in a week in the morning i log on and kids run up to the camera and they ask me like lots of different questions they'll be like how much money do you make or like what's your favorite part of your job and it's, a, it's a, such a good start to my day and it's really good because it's just online as well and then I also did one for founders for schools and um, which is part of uh, anything UK work with as well so it's really good because you can just sign up almost make a profile and then teachers will ask you to come to their event so I did one actually just two weeks ago and um, but yeah I also am a mentor to other people but then I have mentors myself so I think it's just about, uh, and I agree with Leslie, but what you were saying about uh, the trailblazers, 100% I agree with. They're the ones who comment on my things and they're, they're wanting to help as well. And I think one thing to know is, you know, maybe even if the trailblazers don't have time, even if you're able to like, tag them in things, it means that their community can still see it as well. So I think there's other ways that you can help. And one thing for me is that I get maybe messages a lot on LinkedIn about maybe some advice on university or they want to know more. So one thing that really in my next step to do is I want to write like a blog about maybe different things and also have links about maybe some of the podcasts I've done or almost create like a resource hub so I'm maybe not just, you know, messaging the same things to younger girls. And like, I want to have those individual connections, but at the same time, I need to be very wary of like my time management as well, <laughs> which is something I'm always working on. So yeah, I think if you're able to like create content, if you are a trailblazer out right there and you're doing amazing things, if you're able to, you know, create content yourself that you can then share really easily with someone else, then that's like a really effective way and they can almost come back to you with really specific questions rather than spending a lot of time like maybe saying the, you know, similar things to, to people. But yeah, I do a lot of role modeling and that's something that's really encouraged through the Young Innovators program. So I'm just reading the comments in the chat and there's a lot about juggling your time, getting up an hour earlier to get things done, balancing your, your, how you feel about wanting to give back alongside your family responsibilities or your studying responsibilities or like for Penny, your other work responsibilities. I must say, I do feel that pain. Until January this year, I was still working in a full-time job because I had to pay my mortgage and do what I had to do. And I've been running Boost for three years while working in a full-time job and doing volunteer work and doing all those other things that I was trying to do to get my community sorted out. So yeah, it was all, especially through COVID. So it's all quite, um, quite interesting. And um, I just, uh, having a look, there is um, a comment here which I thought was really interesting to pick up on, which is about how how you might approach the research part to understand the market that you're trying to enter, to understand the gap, and to understand that to to actually approach the research for your project, for your product, or for your service. Um, so, do we have any any comments about how you how you got started to really to really delve down into the problem you were trying to solve. Um, I might I might go back to Leslie for that one first. Yeah, this was this is kind of easy for me because I literally started this as a PhD student. So the research was the goal. <laughs> you know, the research was the task at hand. And um, so but you know I can and before that, I was in the academy. So as a professor, it, it was also, research was my job. So I'm, I don't know if I'm necessarily the best person to ask what it's like if, you're, if you don't have that foundation. Um, but if you do have that foundation, it doesn't mean it's easier. It just means that, you know, you have to go down the right rabbit hole. And I think you have to be nimble about making sure you're going down and answering, you know, the right questions along the way. For example, um, you, know, I, you know, I was asking some questions to one of my Facebook groups about, okay, I have this situation where I was asked to research the impact on these workshops as they might be offered to white men. And, you know, I just wanted to do a face palm because, you know, it's not that I don't want to serve everybody, um, but having come from an institution where 
you know, 29 out of 30 of my students were white men, um, and four out of my students were Latino or Latinx, and two of my students were women. It's like, I don't think I need, you know, I really don't think I need to research that area. But when, you know, the responses I got back were, you know, you should study critical race theory and ethnic studies, women's studies. And it's like, I can't, you know, yes, I do. I do. I need to study all that stuff. But, you know, at a certain point, it's when you're asking for feedback, it's like, don't give me the kitchen sink. Because there, of course, is a lot of stuff to research. And I think being nimble about saying, can you send me an article that encapsulates what you're saying? Because I have time to read one today. <laughs> I cannot read seven. I cannot read 15 today. Um, but then, you know, um, if my if my PhD advisors were listening to this, they're like, then what are you doing, Leslie? <laughs> You're probably is- reading 15 articles today, or at least 15 abstracts. So anyway, um, doing the research is, wow, it's it's important, but it's also, it needs to be super focused. And when you're asking yeah. for help, making, making sure that that help is focused as well. I was going to say we're back to managing our time and juggling all these priorities again. Um, I, I suspect at, at what I write down in my notes is I'm, I'm, listening to everybody and and reading the chat is really that for us at Boost, our customer focused and human centered design approach really started with empathy. So yes, okay, it started with my mum and her experience and her telling me at great length over and over what her her negative, uh, what her pain points were. But then at that point, we didn't know that other people, I didn't know that other people felt exactly the same way. And I guess um, with Penny as well, that might be a similar thing that you as as the only woman in your team, as a female engineer, you don't necessarily know at that point at that starting point that that there are loads of other people that probably that might feel the same way and so I think that for me was the the point where I was like right we need to research this how do we do it how do we find these other people who might be having these same pain points um Penny did you is that kind of what you did or is that is that quite different no yeah you you yes 100% very similar and I think a lot of um, kind of ideas, innovations comes from personal experience or, or like a, a grandma or like maybe a, a friend who's disabled, like really experiences something which you maybe in your shoes you've never realised. And I think for context, um, for my final year project, for my master's uh, product design engineering, you have to come up with your own problem and you have to solve it yourself. And I will tell you now, coming up with a problem is the hardest thing because it's just not organic. Like, so I spent my summer googling like different problems okay how can we you know solve world hunger or like how can we make life better for like animals in the ocean for example and you you come up and you think you've packed you're like oh my goodness I've identified a problem then you google a solution for it and I'm like oh someone's already solved it there's no point in me doing it but I think something I really learned in that is there's probably there's probably not many ideas that people actually haven't come up with already but if you have the tenacity and you have the drive to actually do something about it and solve it, there's not that many people out there who do that. So like if you have something that in your gut or you just think that's not right or, you know, it could be done better, then go for it. Because probably other people will think, oh, I, I mean, I can't be bothered doing that. Like I, I'm fine with maybe the, the thing that's been designed for me that's not that great, but it does the job. Like I'll go on with it. But if you're really passionate about something, then yeah, I would say uh, go for it. And, my friend, she's an actual PhD design researcher. She always talks about problem framing as well. So, okay, you identify a problem, but don't just jump in and think you have the solution. Really try and figure out what is that problem because it might be you need to take a bit more of a step back to really look at the overall picture versus maybe just that one smaller problem that you've identified. And I think that's where you can get really good innovation. Oh, my life just went out. <laughs> Uh, you have to move keep moving penny keep moving keep the lights on and um, that and it's interesting to look at the chat when people are saying and we've got um kamara uh, i hope i've said that right who said that she's come up with her product through empathy just empathizing understanding people's challenges and speaking to people who had similar problems and and i think that that is a really good a really good place to start you see you go from experience really and look at what's there and then we move forward into into like 
planning a business or, or working out where to invest our time to develop something that can help to solve those problems. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit about where we've come from and, and sort of the challenges of, of how we've been getting on. But I'd love to know, um, and I might, I might come back to Penny before your light switches off again <laughs> while you're moving about. Um, what are the biggest setbacks that you've had to overcome so far? And, and what do you think you've learned from overcoming them? Uh, I think that one of the biggest kind of setbacks is I'm very much want to research and really want to have everything perfect before I, I do it. So like these workshops, I feel like this is very similar to what Leslie was saying. I feel like I've been preparing them for ages. Like I just want to do it now. Um, and I think I, it's that balance between the, the engineer in me and also this kind of new business entrepreneur mind I've got is that sometimes you just need to get stuff out there and get real feedback from it. Like at the end of the day, the real feedback is if someone would have paid for this or are they not. Um, so I think that's kind of maybe one step back for me is like the, the a mentor always says, he's like, well, you can research forever. Like you, you don't need to research, like you just need to someday just do it. And the quicker you make that decision, the quicker you make the move, then, you know, the, the faster and the, the further you're going to get in the future. And um, so I think that's probably just one kind of almost like challenge and, and setback for me there. And I think the same is, is what you said, Sam, the fact you're working full time for, for three years, you know, before you could really fully commit um, and, and switch over 100 percent the whole, uh, oh, my lights are out, <laughs> the whole like balancing and uh, time management between working oh <laughs> sorry and um, between uh, working like for my full-time job which I really love and I'm an engineer there and I'm you know using technology to help people which is really at my core and what I want to do as well as you know learning and, and trying to set up a business on the side and um, that's definitely a, a challenge and um, but then as you said like there's beautiful things that come come from it so because of DIY Women I got asked to do that workshop like with the kids you know two weeks ago and it was like in one week's time and I just said yes let's do it and from that I learned so much and it's now really given me the confidence to progress forward and I think sometimes you just need to book a date in the diary and not push it back <laughs> and just just commit to it and there's going to be challenges along this way but just trust yourself that you'll solve them. We like that we like that kind of attitude just get on with it just do it I really like that. Um, Leslie, um, we've actually got a, a question in the chat, if that's okay. Um, I just, I'm just aware of time and I want to address the question, so I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, Leslie, if you had to pick one single motivator that keeps you going, what would you say is your motivation? Because I do think this is a wonderful question, so um, thank you to Brenda for asking us. <laughs> Fear and panic, I think. <laughs> Because, you know, there's a there's a cartoon. I have so many of these pop culture references. There's a cartoon of a guy who says, as I'm writing this, I will swear to God and everyone that it only takes me 15 minutes to pack for to go on a trip overseas. I, I swear, like, why, what, why does packing take more than 15 minutes? But time and again, when he, you know, it's ready to go, it's like, freak out like ah uh, you know so there's there's this time management thing but it's it's also a great motivator he did a ted talk on it i mean it's like next level stuff it's like you know it but do you um and so it's um definitely fear and panic fear of letting people down that's the motivator um it because and the reason why i say this is i feel inspired and honored to be able to work with people um, right now, I'm leading a workshop with uh, some girls in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, with an organization called Audio Girl Africa. And so, you know, I'm giving to them, you know, this opportunity to get certified. But the on the ground work is fear and panic. It's like, do I have everything? Am, are they getting what they need? Reading people's expressions. If you're a teacher, you know what I mean? It's just like, is it getting in there? You know, um, and it leaves you exhausted at the end of the day. So, you know, okay, so I made a little, a funny little answer to the question, but I, I do believe it's that wanting to do a good job for people, you know, wanting to, to help people in a way that's not, um, uh, not over ambitious. You know, if somebody says, oh, I'm moving next Saturday. Can you help me move? You say yes, 
but it means that you have to get your shoes on, go there, get somebody to watch your dog so you can help your friend move. It's going to be a long day. It's You're going to be exhausted. What do you have planned tomorrow? Are you going to be too tired? And so it's, it's one thing to want to help, but it's another thing to do the work. Um, but that motivation, I guess, if I were to be really honest, is just, you know, just the desire to help and change the world. Oh, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you, Leslie. There's lots and lots of people in the in the chat um, enjoying your your response, um, especially the the fear and panic part. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's quite interesting. Um, and and Penny, do you have thoughts on on the main motivator that keeps you going, that drives you to do what you're doing at the moment? Oh, <laughs> every time I talk to Penny, the lights go off. <laughs> I know, it's like, <laughs> you've got, got a magic wand over there. Um, yeah, I think very similar to Leslie, actually, in terms of wanting to empower and teach other people. Like, for me, um, I could sit in a workshop and develop a product by myself. And I think that's something I thought I would want to do. But at the end of the day, it would involve me being in a workshop by myself, like change around with electronics or my 3D printer. And it's, it's very lonely. And I think... There's a reason that the first job I thought I was going to do was be a math teacher is because I love to teach. I'm the eldest of five and the moment when you teach someone else to do something and you see that light bulb go off is, is the best feeling in the world. And um, so, yeah, I think for me, DIY Women is really being able to share that knowledge and, you know, create a space where people feel like, do you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try this and I, I'm not scared to use this power drill because, and once you've done it once, it's like, oh, I've done it. And you they really feel like empowered and that they can go off and I was helping a, 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 in the park the other day with really young kids and I was had the drill and we were uh, painting wooden panels and putting them on a big planter and it was amazing to see some of the younger kids like you know once they used the drill once they were like yes yeah, stand aside Perry I'm doing this by myself <laughs> and for me that is something which I really wish I'd had when I was growing up um, and yeah so for me definitely empowering other people is teaching them how to, to do it themselves uh, rather than you just doing it. I think it's really amazing that we're all drawing on our personal experiences and, and the things that we've that we've experienced uh, particularly as our motivators and the, and that way that we feel towards other people that we feel like we're doing it for. I mean if I was to answer that motivation question I'd probably say that the initial motivation was just like my mum needed a new boob <laughs> we had to make and there wasn't one that she wanted so we ended up making one and that was our initial motivation when you live really closely I'm very lucky that my mum is a big part of my life she helps me with my childcare. she's a great she's a, a wonderful person and when you see that person every day and they're going I need this thing somebody needs to make this thing happen then that's a massive motivation and that's that's kind of what what was driving me and when it, when it was really hard and I was working really hard to try and get enough money so I could plow my own money into the business to make it work and um, before we had our investment and when we were just sort of surviving on little bits of grants here and there and I was working full time it was because because every day I would see my mum <laughs> and every day she'd be like how is it going? Are you getting on with this now? Are you doing it? When is it coming? When am I going to get this? <laughs> and that's a, that's a massively powerful <laughs> motivator when, uh, when you've got a mum who's trying to sort of just push you on because she wants you to do the thing that you're supposed to be doing. So yeah, yeah, it's quite um, really an interesting question. And I, I guess um, that's, that's part of what, um, what pushes people forward. So um, we are, I, I just want to, um, jump a little bit to think about we've talked about what's motivated us but we we haven't talked very much quite yet about the support structures that we've had around us and I think it's really important to have both of those things to embark on on your journey as an innovator so you have to have that motivation that driving factors and we've talked about that and the way that we've identified the market needs um, and the, the kind of niches for the work that we want you to do but actually um, building your support, the support around you to make sure that you're able to deliver that, I think is a really um, key factor in being able to do it successfully without going completely 
nuts <laughs> or um, having some sort of breakdown, which is, I mean, it's, it is difficult. We've all said it's difficult. We've, there's people in the chat talking about juggling their time and, and all that type of stuff. So having those support structures around you is really important. So um, Leslie, can you, is there anything that, that's happened? Is there any support that you've really accessed that's made a really big difference to you? Um, or that how have you managed to build the support structures that you've needed to be able to embark on your innovation journey? Um, well, the Women in Innovation Award, that's the biggest one right now, you know, and Innovate UK and, you know, um, having financial support and seed funding for business is crucial. So that's the support I need. And then, you know, the package of support that comes, you know, having access to a mentor and um, an accountant and the lawyers and, you know, um, having access to these brains is, is important in the workshops. Um, if I didn't have that, yeah, I, I would really be struggling. I would really be struggling. I mean, I think the only other support I would get with would be within the university ecosystem where I can go to an advisor or I can go to a, um, a chat. I also participated in a program called Conception X and that, you know, doing the Conception X program helped me have a good business plan to present to women in innovation. So just, you know, I'm 53 year old, 53 years old. Um, I've... Uh, I've learned a lot and um, the most important thing is how to not only manage time but respect time, not only to respect time but honor time and not only to honor time but understand time. And a great rock and roll musician once said, time is but the dividing line between what is true and what is not true. And that's it, you know. Uh, I think a lot of time we're talking about demands on our time but it's an illusion. So um, anybody who gets the reference, I'll uh, buy you a hot chocolate. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but I know we're running out of time, so I'll hand it back to you. There is a, there is a few people just uh, talking about that reference in the chat. Um, and, and the same question to, to Penny, how have you been able to build that support around you to, to embark on your innovation journey? Yeah, I think um, through the Young Innovations Programme, it's obviously it's been an amazing amount of support in terms of mentorship, in terms of like uh, funding to be able to, you know, take that time to research and, you know, to do the, the really the initial stages of, of prototyping, etc. Um, but I think one thing for me that's been, you know, the most beneficial is that meeting the other Young Innovators and having that massive network. For me, um, I mean, you can have a mentor who's really like a lot older than you and they can give you advice, but having the advice of a, another young uh, entrepreneur or innovator who's just, you know, maybe just a wee bit ahead of you in the car, they can give you really real time, almost like feedback right now and say, okay, no, maybe don't do this and do this instead. And that can speed you up so much and it can save you a lot of time. But also for me is every Tuesday morning at half past seven, me and a couple of other young innovators, we have an accountability session. So we get up, I go out for a walk, and then we basically just hold each other account to, okay, what did you say you were going to do this week? Have you actually done it? And what are you going to do next week? And for me, that has been one of the most beneficial things is because when you work by yourself, it's going to be like you start having your mum there. You need someone else there. Like, this is not a, a one-person thing. You know, you need your friends, family, like, support network around you to really get you through those those hard stages when you've maybe a lost a little bit of motivation yourself it's totally fine and it's going to happen but you need those other people around you to, to scoop you up and you know to get you back on and, and it's, it's really been really helpful having the other uh, young uh, innovators there and we'll stay friends like whatever we do and, and I think it's also we're very honest with each other about where we're at and what we're doing with it something's fine but you, you do these programs and you speak to mentors who have years and years experience you almost can like slightly lie or you know you maybe say you're a bit further on than you actually are but whereas when you're having that weekly meeting you're like hey why have you not done this yet like you said you're going to do it a few times like i know i'm scared to they're like well why are you scared like what what's wrong and i feel like you can maybe delve a bit deeper and, and to make sure that you actually do your, what you say you're going to do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think being uh, having a support structure that holds you to account that keeps you on track, 
um, is really, really useful. But the, I mean, the, the key barriers for me, when I was starting out, I was looking at what support I felt I needed. And obviously we've talked about this, but having barriers, financial barriers to overcome, you need C funding, you need some money to get things up and running. That's really important. And, and Innovate UK have funded um, all of us in some way to, to overcome those barriers, to look at how we can, um, we can innovate. But alongside that is that package of work support that even the process sometimes of going through um, thinking about your commercialization planning, like how you're going to develop your ideas after you've done some R&D or some research. Those things are really important, I think, in, in pushing yourself forward and really understanding what your business model could look like in the future. And there is lots of support out there. Um, there is um, business support, there is guidance, and there are these networks, and there's networks of people like us and all the people that we're meeting on the chat, especially, I feel like Brenda and Leslie could be like best friends if they like, <laughs> when, when Leslie buys her the hot chocolate that she's after. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's great uh, to have that network, to see that there's other people who've been through the things that you might have been through, but also to understand, for me, um, I'm really weak in certain areas and I know that. So things like, um, you know, financial reporting and uh, bits and pieces, but to understand that and to find the support in those areas that are not your strengths and to play to your strengths, I feel like that's a really important thing to do as well. So um, I just want to thank everybody for, for joining us who's been here today. Um, yay! <laughs> and for everybody who's been contributing and talking on the chat. And I'm going to pass back over to Veronica for the closing remarks and just to wrap up. And um, I just want to say one more thing before I go back to Veronica, that if you haven't ever applied for Innovate UK funding before, please have a go, because it is not as weird and scary as people might tell you that they think it is, because it really isn't. It's there designed to uh, help you to structure your thoughts and your motivations and your understanding of your business. And even if you don't get the award, the process of applying I found in the past was, was really helpful anyway. And then I submitted again a bit later with a bit more thought, a bit more effort, and then you might get the award. So please don't, please do go for it, but don't be put off by it. That's the, the only thing I would say. Anyway, back to Veronica. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Sam, Leslie and Penny for such an authentic open conversation. Um, it is so important for us all to share challenges and also, of course, to celebrate one another too, as women in a world with so many roadblocks, yet so much beauty, right? So thank you. Thank you so much for such a great session. Um, uh, just a quick note before we close that we are going to organize more webinars this year. Uh, just please keep, keep an eye out on our social media channels and our dedicated Women Innovation Community newsletter to find out more about upcoming sessions. And of course, we will make this recording available as well. Please do share it with your networks as well, especially those who are not able to, uh, to attend today. Um, and yeah, just a big thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, keep being great, keep being resilient, and uh, we will certainly keep in touch. Thank you so much.